algorithms. You hear about them, you know they're behind your screens, and you may even be here as a result of one right now. Do algorithms amplify our worst human behaviors? How do algorithms influence your worldviews? Are social media algorithms making the world worse? I'm gonna to talk to an ex-YouTube engineer who built the algorithms that keep us hooked, a former design ethicist from Google, and a professor from Oxford who believes things may not be as bad as we think they are. But first, an experiment to see how what we feed the algorithm feeds us in return. I'm gonna simulate searching for a video from three different political perspectives in order to see how one simple YouTube search influences the algorithm. We'll check a neutral page, make three different profiles, watch the first video that comes up for each, then observe how searches affect the homepage and recommendations. For control measures, I have three separate laptops. I've cleared the history and the cache on all of them, so we're starting from a neutral slate. All right, so now I'm gonna see just the regular YouTube homepage before I've created anything. I see a few different news videos, a few funny videos, Ed Sheeran, some Alabama football, my dog answers fan questions, a few different news clips, and of course the viral TikTok Fleetwood Mac video. All right, so it's pretty neutral. Let's make these profiles. Okay, so now after I've made my profile, the homepage doesn't look too different. It has a little bit of data on me now because I made that profile, but for the most part, the homepage is pretty similar. Looking at this media bias chart, I can see that Fox News sways more to the right, MSNBC sways to the left, and ABC News is somewhere in the middle. So I'm gonna start with my first simulated political perspective. I've looked at Fox News, and I'm gonna click on the first video. C-SPAN suspends Steve Scully after he admits to lying about Twitter hack. I'm gonna watch the video all the way through. Give it a like. Let's make the second profile. Okay, now I'm gonna simulate the second political perspective from MSNBC. Watch All In with Chris Hayes highlights. Watch the video all the way through. I'm gonna give it a like. One thing that's really interesting, the recommended videos follow the same order for both profiles, but just recommending the different news stations. The first profile recommended three Fox News videos and one PBS video. The second profile recommended three MSNBC profiles and one PBS profile. It seems like PBS is considered quite neutral. It's more educational and academic. So if you're going down some form of a rabbit hole, it's not likely to throw off your search. I think that's something interesting to note. Simulating searching a video from the third political perspective. ABC News, spotlight on early voting in North Carolina. I'm gonna watch the full video and give it a like. Now let's see how the homepage changed. For the first profile, I'm already seeing a big difference. Fox News, Fox Business. I see some favorable videos about President Trump some unfavorable videos about Nancy Pelosi. I do see a Wall Street Journal, but it's mostly Fox channels that are dominating. I do see some positive videos about Amy Coney Barrett, the Supreme Court confirmation. I do see some negative videos about Hillary Clinton. TED Talk, Inside the Mind of a Master Procrastinator. Maybe I should watch that one. And a quirky one about President Trump's dance moves. And that's just from one video search. I saw quite a few videos in favor of President Trump, quite a few videos against Joe Biden, a few funny videos, a few videos about meditation I'm gonna save for later. For the profile where I searched MSNBC, I see another recommended video for MSNBC. I'm not seeing too many other news stations recommended. I see another one from MSNBC, Notre Dame faculty sign open letter urging Judge Barrett to. Okay, I see one from CNN. I see a C-SPAN. I see another MSNBC. Boy surprises childhood best friend dressed as a FedEx driver. That could be a little bit terrifying. Okay, so for the most part, it was a lot of MSNBC, no Fox News outlets, some funny videos, some sports videos. And now the ABC News search. Okay, so let's see how the homepage looks after watching this full video. I see a lot of ABC News right off the bat. I do see a video for Fox News, video from MSNBC, more ABC News, CNBC, one from CBS, ABC News again, a video from GQ. I'm noticing more variety. This is interesting. Trump and Clinton are asked to say something nice about each other. So this is actually bringing both sides together. A hundred year old veteran and his secrets to life. Saving that video. A video in favor of Joe Biden here. A video from Business Insider. There's a lot of variety in content. There's a lot of variety in news stations. And it really isn't a polarizing homepage. 
Okay, so what we can see here is that even by searching just one video, all of the recommendations afterwards reinforced that point of view. There were no recommendations that challenged it. So you'll likely stay longer and continue to watch more videos, which would be in the best interest of both the advertisers and the creators. What does that say about the algorithm? We called up ex-YouTube engineer Guillaume Chalot, who built the artificial intelligence that powers these algorithms. In an article that you wrote for Wired about YouTube's feedback loop, you stated that you could have predicted that the AI would deliberately promote harmful videos behind some of the conspiracies that we've seen recently. How could you have known that ahead of time? And was it flagged? So you can't detect everything ahead of time. The idea is to try to detect as soon as possible. So you can predict that there is going to be toxic feedback loops. How can you see where the feedback loops are taking place? And for that, you need the number of recommendations that a video is promoted. So if you see that a video is particularly being promoted by uh, YouTube uh, and it's toxic, then you know it's going to create a feedback loop. And do you think just the executives had the best interest at heart so people promoting things like fake news and conspiracy theories just wasn't thought of. You thought people would just genuinely post truthful videos in community with one another. So they were really focusing on how to gain market share, be like 20, 30% more efficient every year. There's few millions of people who were going to conspiracy videos because of uh, YouTube recommendations. It was not a big deal for them. Next, I talked to Tristan Harris, who studies the impact of technology on the human mind. It's not just in technology, this is psychology at the intersection of technology fueled by supercomputers. That's right. And let me give you one concrete example of where this can show up in a way it actually was told to me by Guillaume Chaslow, the former YouTube engineer. If YouTube found, for example, as it's predicting which videos should it show you over time, it's not just trying to maximize your individual watch time for that 30 minute session. It also wants to show you the kind of videos that tend to keep you coming back in a long-term sense. So it's actually identifying these super high level hyper object patterns. Let's say one of them is called the media is lying. Let's say that that pattern, that title, is associated with a longer, like year long trajectory of YouTube usage. Because obviously, if I don't trust the media as much, then I'm gonna trust YouTube a little bit more. And so that's an example where there's no human who's picking the media is lying as a phrase, but the computer is predicting and finding out that this is a pattern that works in a super big abstract scale, that for 3 billion humans, that pattern can actually cause uh, people to use YouTube more in the long run. It's not a race that humans are designed to win. A pattern like that can be incredibly dangerous because it erodes trust in society and in media, which is exactly what in general conspiracy theories do. And there's a study in there on sense making that I think only after two minutes of exposure to a conspiracy theory, that people actually have less pro-social attitudes and they're more doubtful of the narratives that they've been told. Anyway, there's, there's many more aspects to, to this story. On the topic of YouTube and Guillaume, we actually just spoke with him. Do you believe that YouTube and social media in general can send us down echo chambers? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the entire model. The issue is that they're a bad apple farm. Like the soil that they create is actually about rewarding the most extreme and conspiracy minded views that you could create because they tend to get the most clicks. And as Renee Diresta, our other colleague who studies conspiracy theories will say, if you can make a conspiracy trend, you can make it true. Because once it's trending, like Biden earpiece or something like that, it can be on either side. Once once it's trending, if the media covers it, they're endorsing the conspiracy theory and elevating its response. If they don't cover it and they don't talk about Biden earpiece, now it's a conspiracy that the media is not covering something that might be true. Exponential rumors and exponential hearsay. That's the kind of thing that wins and it becomes our information ecology. I think it's 700 million hours a day um, people watch on YouTube videos that have been recommended by the algorithm. So the recommendation portion is actually very significant on the content that we end up seeing, right? Exactly. So not only that's significant, but that pushes uh, content creators to go in the same direction as the algorithm. Many content creators, when they talk about what, what they want to do, they try to understand the algorithm and they try to just give what the algorithm likes. They don't try to understand what you like, they try to understand the algorithm. 
Finally, I spoke with Dr. Grant Blank, who's more optimistic about our online habits. And I want to reference a point in your research that I found really interesting. You often hear people go down a rabbit hole, for example, on YouTube, and they come up believing that the world is flat, for example. But according to your research, if somebody goes on social media and ends up changing their mind, they're not in an echo chamber, despite the perception that somebody goes down this rabbit hole and has now fallen victim to these theories because they've changed their mind, that actually proves they're not in an echo chamber? I'm not too worried about the situation that you described of people going down these YouTube rabbit holes, people acquire information in a broad environment um, and broad ways. They also change their mind fairly often about a lot of topics. Not every topic, but about many topics. Yeah, that we're a bit more malleable than, than we think we are. Right, and malleable almost gives the idea that you already had an opinion. It's in most cases people didn't have an opinion beforehand. They only have a vague sense of what's going on and then they encounter a more detailed argument somewhere and that convinces them that the real situation is different from whatever they thought. Some tech executives would say what we see on social media is actually just a reflection of what was always happening, and social media is just shining a mirror on it. Do you think that's true, or do you think it's fueling it? I think it's true in this sense. It used to be reasonable for you would go to a bar and complain to your friends about stuff you read or you saw on television, and it couldn't go any further than that because you had no way to reach a broader audience. What has happened with the internet and the technologies of social media is all of a sudden you can complain to everybody. And so the things that once were kept in small circles are now visible to the entire world. And and so these sort of conspiracy theories and hatred of different groups of people and things like that, which would normally not be expressed loudly in the public square, are now being expressed loudly on Twitter and Facebook and other places. And so what has happened is that technology has amplified all these voices and so that they're no longer talking in private environments, but they're now talking in public. One of your uh, criticisms of YouTube is the secrecy of the algorithm. And you believe that if there was more transparency about how the YouTube algorithm works, people would have a bit more control and we wouldn't see such massive problems as we do today. Yes, yeah, so what I want is not YouTube to give the source code of their algorithm, that's their secret source. What I want is that we have an idea of the impact of YouTube's algorithm. What is it showing our kids right now? I want moms to be able to know what the YouTube algorithm is showing to their kids. I want scientists to know what type of science YouTube is, is showing. Is it promoting uh, fake science? Is it promoting things that have been researched and proved? That's, that's important to know. So while it seems like these algorithms are built to reinforce our likes and our interests, how we seek out information can give us some control. These algorithms are powerful and impressionable, but they're not the entire story. By being aware of how they work and being intentional in finding information, we can get back some control.